people will settle down and realize in time uh, when things settle this is this is political dust it settles mm. and when it settles people will realize what was manmohan singh's contributions to the country to the economy uh, people will realize just like i realize what were vajpayee ji's contributions to the economy what were vajpayee ji's contributions to nation building so every prime minister and i'll tell you even prime ministers who had who were in power for a short while they were prime ministers again well before your time vp singh chandrashekhar um ik gujral many of them in their own small way for a small period of time also had significant contributions dr manmohan singh was extremely encouraging he had no insecurity about it he wanted people to speak he wanted to consult younger people to seek their opinions breaks my heart a little bit about what dr manmohan singh said um where he hopes that history will be kind of dedicated his whole life you know to our country he's done these incredible things and he's remembered for the last pr campaign that we have gone against not going to say too much about milind devra other than the fact that he's respected both by his own party the congress as well as folks on what is perceived to be the other side which is the bjp side everyone speaks positively about milind devra Tehsin Punawala a respected political commentator appeared on TRS and said that Milan Deora is the likely PM candidate from the Congress side so this whole conversation was about me trying to get to the core of Milan Deora's heart trying to get to the depths of his mind and trying to understand his vision for the future of the country lots of people have said a lot of things about our political podcast it's always an intention of mine a core intention of mine to present a centrist perspective a steel man perspective a 360 degree perspective to the viewers i hope this podcast helps you understand more about the congress party and i hope you understand more about politics and governance through this conversation as well lots of love to everyone for supporting this is an epic detailed conversation with one milind devra someone who i respect tremendously someone who i enjoyed speaking to tremendously and you'll understand where the respect and enjoyment came from if you consume the entire episode enjoy today's episode it's an epic political conversation Mr. Deora, welcome to TRS. Thank you. Thank you for how, having me. How are you, sir? Very well. Thank you. It's how are you? Very, very cool to see a modern young politician very open to being on an Indian podcast. Um, I'm not sure if 46 years is considered young today, but when I first entered Parliament and I got into politics, I was 27 at the time, which was young. That's crazy. Like at age 27, you were in Parliament. it is but you know to be honest i wouldn't have done it if i if it wasn't for a political background and um, so i'm grateful for that political background but um i think that the real the real victory for a country like ours as diverse as ours would be if people in their 20s got into parliament which is the highest legislative body in our country uh, without having a political background Mm. and um but it was a great experience and um my my first uh, memory of entering parliament i had been to parliament several times as a as a guest just to view parliament and view the proceedings where you sit on top i don't know if you ever been there no no <laughs> you should go anyone can go actually really yeah you can uh, you can get a pass and uh, go to parliament and watch the proceedings hopefully you'll go on a day when it isn't getting adjourned <laughs> and uh, you may get to see a debate which is very interesting but my first memory of entering parliament was um looking across the house the lok sabha and seeing people from different states different headgears different dress codes someone from nagaland wearing a traditional um hornbill hat and my first impression was that there's no single physical place in the country where you get to see all of india in all its beautiful diversity as you do in the lok sabha mm. 
Um, that was my first impression, which was very different from when it when I was in, when I entered as an MP on the floor of the house, as compared to when I would go there as a guest, sitting in the galleries. Um, okay, so there's a conversation you can have with someone as a man, a man to man conversation where we can talk about events, and then you can have a boy to boy conversation, where you talk to someone's inner child. So my inner child will ask your inner child, why is your inner child in politics? my inner child is in politics because i think that I, i still believe that there is a lot that needs to happen for india there's a lot that needs to happen for mumbai and with all humility i feel that there are certain experiences that i've had that i want to bring to the table and i think that i'm more passionate about seeing change in society but i debated this for a long time that if i want to bring change in society positive change in mumbai and in india is the private sector the best way is a foundation the best way is philanthropy the best way and i've realized all these are effective ways and you can continue to do all these things but there is no better way to shape the direction of a country of a city i love than being in politics mm. because what politics does is politics gives you a public voice so if i comment on something about mumbai it has repercussions it leads to something and that's what i like about politics okay a uh, very raw question what's it like actually serving in the cabinet when you were a minister of state like what is the day to day is it like a lot of bombing towards you and then problem solving and strategizing because that's the vibe my whole team got from that uh, series we did everyone was running around all the time it was very high it's intensity it's hectic you know being in government frankly i i being a minister in government um is a tough job it's a very difficult job uh if you are a lok sabha mp and you're a minister in the government of india nurturing your constituency finding the time to come to your constituency to meet disgruntled people to meet party workers who are like where have you been for so many weeks <laughs> uh to meet voters who are like i voted for you i'm not so concerned about what you're doing in that ministry i want to know what you're doing in my local locality and at the same time having to balance your duties as a minister i think it was it, it's it's very challenging so when when they get shifted from one ministry to another is it because they usually underperforming depends on the prime minister uh, concerned it depends on gov- the government so sometimes um, it, it depends it really depends on on why people get shifted out but uh, you know a minister doesn't just a minister is not just and performance also is not just measured by certain metrics in your ministry performance can also be how well you're taking a particular legislation or a policy to the public mm. um i'll give you an example sure. i was um so when i was a uh, minister of you interviewed uh, rajiv chandrashekhar i had ex- exactly his job yeah and um uh, you know i was overseeing the national e governance plan of india what was then called negp which was largely the focus was how do you reduce the interface between the citizen and government to make the citizen to ensure that the citizen is able to access services as quickly as possible to ensure that there's no corruption and the challenge for me was that we had debated a lot of policies on e-governance but then i i realized that we need quick wins we need to demonstrate that we can give citizens guarantee citizens access to public services as quickly and effectively as possible and two very Uh, uh, very exciting schemes that were rolled out by the ministry of it were the passport seva kendra and the online filing of income tax returns and those were humongous game changing legislations and policy changes because prior to passport seva kendra a citizen when they wanted to have their passport renewed or they wanted to get extra pages on their passport to travel overseas they had to try and get access to their member of parliament who in turn would write to the passport office and the passport office may or may not entertain their request and they had to wait in a long line and there was no guarantee that they would get that service passport seva kendra is outsourced to tcs which is one of the biggest it companies in the world run by the tata group they implement it on behalf of the government they charge a fee obviously and the citizen within a few days time gets a passport renewed and they get it quickly no corruption no waiting no running behind somebody some politician or clerk or a babu you get it done quickly same thing with filing of income tax returns 
Mm-hmm. So, and those are schemes which have expanded over time into even faceless returns, where now you can file your returns and if there's a query and an assessing officer says that if you've paid X amount of tax, I think you owe us Y amount of tax. That's done in a faceless way to again to eliminate corruption. So I do recall, you know, in a funny way that when we were in power and there was this debate about Lokpal and a lot of people felt that Lokpal was the solution to fight corruption. And I would always say that Lokpal as a legislation is one thing, that it has its merits, but the way to fight corruption is to make government smaller and more efficient, not to make government bigger. You mean the government businesses, government run businesses? I mean, I mean the interface between citizen and bureaucrat or citizen and politician. If you eliminate layers, if a citizen needs a public service, the citizen needs a passport renewed, um, the citizen needs an LPG cylinder, if you can eliminate layers between that citizen to get that service, you need permission, let's say you have a restaurant and you want permission from the municipality of your particular city. If you can eliminate the number of layers through which your file moves, you reduce corruption. Mm. It's controversial. Yeah, no, it's and, um, also mathematical. It's, ex- it's very basic. But Exactly. So, so small government is the answer to fighting corruption, in my opinion. Uh, today, for instance, you know, now, now there's a topic called disinvestment. Should you, should the people, of, should the taxpayer of India be funding uh, loss-making public enterprises, state-owned enterprises? Now, for example, as a country, we've privatized Air India. I'm all for it. But again, it's an example of large government. Can the government provide, run a hotel better than the private sector? Can the government ensure that every person who's staying at that government-owned hotel is a paying resident and a paying guest? It doesn't work that way. Someone down in the system will say, this is my friend, give him a free room or give him a free seat on my plane. And that's how you encourage corruption. Yeah, my reading of this, again, this is based on a lot of the historical podcasts we've done, is that the British effed shit up for us when they were leaving a little bit. They systematically wrecked a lot of stuff, kept all these layers, ensured that we were a ripe ecosystem for corruption. And then whatever governments came in power since the British left probably saw the corruption uh, conducive architecture and said, let's leave it as it is. And because there was that much money to be made. And the thing is, even today, there's that much extra money to be made. So as a young Indian, I'm a little... I, I want to say a little skeptical and a little bit curious to see how corruption is actually removed from the system. Of course, I'm hopeful. I'm optimistic. That's all of young India. But practically, how do you remove corruption? Because there's a lot of money to be made in the system. Look, if the truth is to remove corruption, ultimately, if it takes two hands to clap, if the person who is buy, who is acquiring a government service wants to pay money, if someone gets caught driving on the wrong side of the road, and a traffic policeman pulls him or her over. If that person doesn't want a ticket um, and doesn't want to pay a fine and wants to pay the policeman, it takes two hands to clap. That person is also aiding, abetting corruption. Mm. Um, But the easiest way to eliminate... Now, for example, in Mumbai, let's say, you have CCTV cameras. They immediately know with the radar how fast you're going. You automatically get a notification that you've been fined. There's no interface between the driver and the policeman. Remove the human factor. You remove the human interface completely. So Mm. this this was controversial when I would talk about it. But as part of the national e-governance plan, this was a huge mission for me, which was how do you use e-governance to just eliminate that human interface? And the minute you do it in every sector, you will see corruption go down. And I, but where I, I would little disagree with you is, you know, when the British left us, I mean, they left us bankrupt. They left us as a country where the literacy rate was so low, uh, the infant mortality rate was so high, the life expectancy was so low. And at that time, the government had to build many of these sectors and these companies, they had to be state-owned. We didn't have, for instance, a robust private sector. We had hardly a few companies in the private sector, the Birla group, the Bajaj group, um, who were there pre-independence. So you needed government to be in every business. 
But today you don't need government to be in every business. Today the private sector has come of age in India. And if you look at a sector like defense, we are still as a country subsidizing the economies of Russia, of Israel, of America, of France. Today the private sector has come of age. Yeah. Today there's no reason why the LNTs of the world and you have so many engineering companies cannot do cannot build world class defense companies that are not just sustaining our domestic indigenous requirements but that can become net exporters uh, the same is true let's say of a sector like space the space sector has opened up which i find very encouraging we're a little late as compared let's say to the united states um, but i think that in india this is an area which we can also compete for instance in drones in robotics uh, these are areas which are going to be at the crossover between military use and civilian use one interesting statistic we have in our defense in the defense ministry there's an uh, an agency called drdo which is the defense research development organization and the drdo was set up if i'm not mistaken on the same year as darpa in the united states which stands for defense advanced research project agency now darpa went on to create the internet and drdo has not really come up with something groundbreaking in terms of innovation so i think these are areas now where we have a robust private sector where we can use the private sector to work in conjunction with the government I and innovate i don't know who had brought this up but someone had brought this up on the show they said i think drdo has something like 80000 employees or some some huge number of employees so what are 80000 people doing there like why are they on a payroll yeah but look that the, the reason the reason darpa has succeeded as compared to a drdo in defense and the reason darpa would come up made came up with the internet they invented the internet was because they interfaced very well with universities and with the private sector they didn't function and operate in a silo mm. where it was government bureaucrats sitting and deciding you know should we invest in research for a mosquito repellent should we invest in research for a tank they were working with the private sector so those are the things that we need to change and i think that india is at a cusp now because of what's happening with china in my opinion there's a very big strategic advantage that we have a very big strategic tailwind and with the private sector in the country that's come of age i think it's very critical um for us as a country especially in strategic areas like defense in space uh to ensure that drdo isro are working very closely with universities with academics and with the private sector i've been a minister of uh, telecommunications where we had a company called bsnl and mtnl uh, they still exist and um, i would i i i recall um, it's a funny story i remember once there was a question in parliament about the 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 lack of good services of mtnl and bsnl mtnl really caters to mumbai and delhi bsnl to the rest of india and there was a question by mps about how why is mtnl and bsnl's quality of service so poor compared to the private sector and um, i would say i was my my ministry we were getting kind of trolled by mps and the the joke was that mtnl uh, they were saying that you know you in the ministry you people think that mtnl stands for mahanagar telephone nigam limited actually it stands for mera telephone nahi lagta hai <laughs> and uh, bsnl which the real name of bsnl is bharat sanchar nigam limited and they said gaon mein log kya kehte hain ki bsnl means bhai saab nahi lagta hai <laughs> and um, you know so i i do recall when that happened and i was very very um, upset angry i went to my office my ministry office to sanchar bhavan which is the headquarters of the department of telecommunications and i immediately called all the officers the M, the cm the, the managing directors of these companies and i looked at successive reports that bsnl mtnl's quality of service and trai which is the regulator monitors these is the lowest compared to everyone in the private sector and when i asked them why um i i quickly realized that no gov no government no person who is in charge of these companies the mds didn't want to do what was right for the company because the fear was if they did something and bought the right equipment which may have been more expensive or they placed their tower on top of a building which may have cost more money to them they feared 
that there would be a CVC inquiry, which is the Central Vigilance Commission. There would be a CBI inquiry. And they were like, I don't want to do anything. So there was no buy-in from them to feel that we own this company. And we have a sense of ownership in this company. Why would there be an inquiry? People are afraid. Somebody will make an accusation that why did you buy these microphones? Why didn't you buy a cheaper microphone? Like the opposition might say something? Not just the opposition. Somebody will complain. So people, you know, so, so bureaucrats and people who are in charge of certain companies are sometimes afraid to take decisions because they are afraid that if we take a decision, which may be in the company's long-term interest, someone could say, why did you do this? And um, so the, the answer to me was very simple. That as long as government runs these companies, ultimately, can government provide a sense of ownership to the management of these companies? Can government tell a Indian telecommunications service officer who is the CMD of a company like BSNL, I want to give you full power, go and fight in the marketplace, ensure that you compete against all the private rivals. Okay. Are you willing to give them that freedom? And it's very tough for the government to do that. Because even if the government says, I'm giving you full freedom, if that person is afraid, that person won't take a decision. And the same is true of every sector. Then on top of that, there is another big problem, which is a B2C business, a business to consumer business is very different. It's architecturally very different from a B2B business. So let's say there's a company like ONGC, which is exploring for oil and gas. They are essentially selling to refiners. It's largely a B2B business. You and I as consumers don't ever interface with ONGC. But say Air India, before it was sold to the Tatas, it was a B2C business. We were flying on Air India. We wanted to get the best experience. We had many airlines to compete with Air India. We were looking at what kind of food they had, what systems they had to inform us if the flight was delayed, for instance, how affordable their prices were how well maintained their planes were, how clean they were. In the B2C space, it's very, very tough for the government to compete. It's very tough. It's very tough to get the customer service that you get um, in a public insurance company as compared to what you'd get in a private insurance company. It's very tough to get the customer service you'll get in a private airline as compared to when Air India was public. Despite all our problems, despite whatever controversies have happened in the past, our telecom story, our internet story, the fact that you and I are talking on this channel and that the market share of podcasts and YouTubers is growing in comparison to traditional mediums like television or DTH, in fact, higher in some cases than it is in American and Western democracies, tells you that our internet uh, telecom story has worked, regardless of which party is in power. There have been tweakings here and there. There have been controversies here and there. Different governments have gotten into different controversies. The aviation industry, for instance, also a very good example, where today you have a very healthy, very robust aviation industry. You have fares that are affordable, where today if somebody wants to travel from Mumbai to, let's say, rural Uttar Pradesh, it could sometimes, depending on which sector, depending on when you book the ticket, you could get a, a, a one-way ticket at a cheaper price, if not the same price as you would get a railway ticket. But, and timing, there's no comparison. If you look at the insurance industry, there was a time well before you were born um, where the only way someone could buy life insurance was through the government monopoly LIC. The only way you could insure your car, for example, or your motorbike was through a government monopoly, through many of GIC and its subsidiaries. Today, think of how many private insurers there are. I don't want to name them, but there are so many private insurers. Think of the customer service you're getting. Back in the day, just for your information, when uh, 30, 40 years ago, if you banged your car into another car, nobody asked the other person for insurance papers. You just basically two people got out, got into a fist fight, <laughs> and the guy who won, the other person had to pay for the damage. Nobody went and processed an insurance claim because they knew to process the claim, there would be corruption. It would take a long time to process that claim. Today, you can technically, if you someone hits your car, you don't even have to know who's hit your car your insurance will process it in one second when it goes to the mechanic and you repair your car. Now, that's an example of how services have changed for the better. So these three are good examples of where if you lower the share of government, the market share, none of these sectors, the government's market share is zero, by the way. In, in aviation, it's zero now. But in telecom and in uh, insurance, they still have market share. 
but when you reduce the government's mono- market share from a monopoly to a minimal share and you expand the private sector's market share you get innovation and that innovation ultimately translates to you and me the customer so i'm excited that even in a sector like defense there's no reason why we can't do that where we reduce the government's we we don't shut down companies but we reduce their market share because you're growing the pie mm. in insurance by the way when insurance sector was open to the private sector the allegation was lic will die but lic today is doing very well its revenue has grown its market cap has grown but its market share has reduced obviously because its market share was 100% during monopolistic times and now it's come down but the pie has gotten bigger so i'm not sure what lic's market share is let's say it's 40% but if lic's market share is 40% that 40% is worth much more than 100% was 20 or 30 or 40 years earlier or if it or what it would have been if we had not liberalized the insurance sector man i honestly now see why they say that you're a possible pm candidate like after getting to know you this is not the end of the episode like but you speak with a lot of clarity and there's a lot of research and there's a lot of uh work that's gone on in your life honestly uh little stupid question but like when you're a member of the opposition what's your professional life like it depends what you're doing in the opposition okay so if you're um, um so for instance uh, you know i i would say that uh, the opposition in india uh you you tend to sort of the the opposition is always holding the government accountable but as elections get closer and closer the gears start to shift so today for instance you're seeing the the opposition and when i say the opposition not just at the party level not just at the leadership level but at my level at somebody in raghav chadda who you interviewed yesterday um shiv sena any other opposition parties the gears are starting to shift you're now moving into higher gears because now is the time when opposition gets very active about increasing the intensity about exposing the government so um it, it's it's a it's an interesting question because there's a window when the government has time and regardless of which governments in power to get certain things done which otherwise would be very controversial where the opposition might be willing to concede might be willing to work together as elections start to approach that window starts to close mm. um so i think now what will start happening is you'll start seeing far more a far more belligerent opposition you'll start seeing everybody pulling their socks up getting very very active um in mumbai recently we had the india opposition meet um, let's talk about that as well sure uh, raghav spoke about it yesterday uh, again from an outsider's objective perspective this was the obvious political move that everyone who's not bjp had to do you all had to like come together and figure what's next i'm not sure if we had to come together um we didn't come together in 2018 one year before the 2019 election um the opposition didn't come together um it it doesn't i i wouldn't say we had to do it there were there's always been there's always been two fronts and then there are people who do their own thing mm. broadly uh, in india i mean very broadly that's india's political history for you sure what seems to be shaping up ranveer which is unique uh, in our country's political history is there are now two very distinct fronts and the third l- sort of front if you will yeah. are becoming now irrelevant niche um irrelevant entities everybody is joining either front a or front b i was in mumbai i was very involved in hosting in organizing this um the 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 two day event um and i think that it's it's what will come out of it to be honest i don't want to make a political statement here but it's hard to predict but i think what has certainly happened is that parties that otherwise were not even on talking terms parties that otherwise didn't have a personal camaraderie and a personal relationship are now extremely close the prince, the leaders of both parties of those parties for instance are now breaking bread together they they there's i mean probably speaking they they're slapping each other on the back and joking with one another they have a friendly relationship uh, there is a very strong camaraderie between them and to me that is a very big game changing situation in indian politics so for instance an aam aadmi party congress 
um, we didn't have the relationship six months ago that we have today. Um, uh, uh, Trinamool Congress from West Bengal and the Congress Party didn't have the relationship we did we do today that we we didn't have it one year ago. So it's interesting. What I would broadly say is that you know I've, I've often said this that politics is more di disruptive than the internet. But what's very certain is that in India, when you have a two-way fight in almost every constituency, a two-way fight, BJP versus one candidate on the ballot, it becomes extremely hard for BJP to win that. And that's the direction that the opposition is going in. That's the direction that the India Alliance is going in. How do you ensure that there's no wastage of votes, that votes consolidate towards one candidate fighting against BJP? Yeah. Um, you know that thing I asked you about a boy-to-boy -boy conversation? I have another question that's same tangent. And to explain the question, I'll have to give my own perspective on the question first. Hypothetically, if I were to become a political leader, if I had all the power in the country, I would have two or three areas in my own heart which matter to me, which would probably be my main mission with my political career. For example, education. I think it's the root cause of many of the problems in our society. Second, say that maybe uh, I would love to see an India where everyone has some phase of military training in their life just because of what it can do to the mind and what it can do to systems. Even if those people don't take up a military career, they can go to other domains and, you know, flourish there because of the discipline they've picked up here. Uh, this is just what's close to my heart. Third, um, you know, something to do with uh, women's welfare. I'm just saying things off the top of my head. So I want to throw that question at you. That if hypothetically you were the PM or you had all the power in the country uh, tomorrow and you had it for five years, it's a very Anil Kapoor and Nayak <laughs> question. But I definitely wouldn't roam around the streets with police <laughs> convoys and issue orders on the street because I I think that 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 movie um, of you know, someone has a problem, I'm issuing an order. Mm. Governance doesn't work like that. Right. With due respect, Anil is a good friend of mine, but with, with due respect to that movie and the filmmakers, you you need to take time. You need to study things. Mm. You can't do things in a knee-jerk reaction and you sign a file and hogya and transfer a guy. It doesn't work like that. Can't beat up goons when you're doused. Yeah, that keychain. definitely not. And um, I mean, what would happen if politicians were going around beating up people with two, three police cars behind them? That would be... So, but but you know, for me, what interests me is, and there's there's a common theme in my in my politics, is really a transforming governance. And I know that sounds very cliched, but I had the opportunity, Ranveer, to initiate the debate on a, one of India's most historic legislations called the Right to Information Act. Prior to 2005, a citizen of India was unable to ask the government for any information. Today, you and I as citizens, because of the Right to Information Act, can write to the Prime Minister and the PMO or the Chief Minister's office and demand answers about the Prime Minister's um, tour, uh, tours, the Chief Minister's work, about a particular department, about when a train is going to start. That never existed before. So Right to Information has transformed India, made governance far more accountable, far more transparent. I had the opportunity to initiate that debate in parliament. Little plug, it, my speeches on YouTube if anyone wants to get bored for 20 minutes. <laughs> um, E-governance, reducing the human interface between citizen and government to improve transparency, to improve governance. So those are areas that are, I'm very passionate about. This is also your experience speaking up. I don't know. You know, this is an area which on day one of my politics, uh, is something that I wanted to do. How do you just improve government? Uh, government to me looked like this large body which was which we are disconnected from. You know, we study civics in school, but nobody remembers A, B, C of civics, forget A to Z. Yeah. Um, and I knew a little bit because I come from a political background, but I wanted to make government more accessible to the people. And I, used to, I started a, a, a very unique scheme actually uh, where we would take college students from Mumbai and take them to parliament. That's why I asked you in my first question, have you seen parliament? And we would take college students to parliament, make them move around, meet leaders of the opposition, meet members of government, meet journalists, 
um visit parliament meet the speaker of the parliament meet the vice president of india who's technically the speaker of the rajya sabha um and give them a 360 degree overview of delhi's political climate and my intention of doing that was to get people exposed to what an mp does mm. and to feel a sense of pride when they enter that building called parliament because otherwise no parent is telling their child beta parliament ja ke dekho and no child is saying or no friend no no two friends are telling each other hey what should we do let's go and get a pass and go and visit parliament and if you don't incul- inculcate those values nobody is going to want to people are going to feel alienated from politicians they're going to treat politicians as some alien who's landed from another planet and we are earthlings and these people are martians the reptilian race exactly <laughs> when actually they are representatives of you and i mm. and when we've elected them they are human beings just like us uh, they are not aliens they are not martians um, they they so bridging that gap that was something which i found very very exciting um, another area which unfortunately i haven't been able to um, i haven't been able to change but i believe very strongly about is you know regardless of where your audience lives which city they live in in, in india if i were to ask your audience this question about who the city the city's mayor is very few of your audience members right now while we're talking and they're thinking about it they're scratching their head they don't know who their city's mayor is and that means that there is a breakdown in urban governance in our cities and to me that's a very very worrying sign because india as you know is one of the fastest urbanizing economies in the world like china um we're growing fast but we're also urbanizing quickly rural areas farmlands are being trans transformed into cities people from villages young children don't want to be farmers they want to come to cities and work here and as we urbanize as cities grow and expand how are we looking at the overall concept of urban development from a point of view of being an economic growth engine mm. so for instance in mumbai we had a city called navi mumbai which was conceived and implemented many decades ago it never really took off now it can take off because the trans harbor ceiling will come and connect mumbai to the hinterland and you'll have what you had for instance in brooklyn and in new york city many many 150 years ago by the way i think in 1883 but the fact that people don't know who their mayor is it's not their fault it's because the mayor is powerless mm. and how do you change that how is it that in a city like london everyone knows that sadiq khan is their mayor they know two people the prime minister of england and they know the mayor in a city in new york they know who the city's mayor is they know who the state's governor is like the chief minister of india of a st- state in india and the president of america changing that that's not just an attitudinal change that requires a governance transformation what's the actual protocol to be able to change this it's an interesting it's a long question answer but basically the, we need to change the structure of how our mayors are elected so right now in a city like mumbai which is the in the bmc which is asia's one of asia's richest municipalities it's by far india's richest municipality the budget of mumbai and the bmc is more than a few state governments in india the mayor is elected is one out of 227 municipal councillors so the city is divided into 227 wards 227 people get elected from different parties in those wards the party which has the maximum number of seats elects a mayor that mayor's vision is limited to his or her ward ki my ward has this sanitation problem it has this garbage problem for a city like mumbai you need a mayor who can think about the entire city what am i doing to solve the housing crisis what zoning should be applicable in north mumbai what zoning should be applicable in south mumbai how am i planning transportation links how am i planning for the future of water supply in mumbai where am i building dams where am i building catchment areas what am i doing for rainwater harvesting you need a mumbai vision you can't have one of 227 councillors only so for that you what i propose is a directly elected mayor all the voters of mumbai elect 227 municipal councillors who will represent them in the municipality just like we have mumbai has 36 mlas who represent us in the maharashtra assembly just like mumbai has six members of parliament who represent us in the parliament of india 
but the city should come together and have a mayoral direct election where we elect the mayor empower the mayor and then you will have a powerful mayor who can oversee the bmc in the same way that you find in a city like london in a city like new york because to coordinate so many things i have noticed when a terrorist attack happens when there's flooding the problem is who's in charge everyone's frustrated angry sometimes we have candlelight vigils sometimes we go on social media and get angry with all politicians the frustration really is in our own ignorance because we are frustrated because we don't know who's in charge so this is a policy change a reform an administrative reform wherein we elect a mayor directly we know that this mayor is accountable okay today there's flooding in the city mr mayor why didn't you invest in adequate storm water drainage networks why are you allowing buildings and high rises to come up in an area that's prone to flooding mr mayor there's another housing crisis why are you not working to eradicate slums mm. why are you not working to remove the mosquito menace and dengue so the reason a city like mumbai and this is true of anywhere by the way this is true of delhi bengaluru chennai anywhere there are some states in india by the way where the mayors are directly elected so in chennai i think uh, in tamil nadu the mayor i believe is directly elected by the people of chennai in chennai which is why stalin who's now the chief minister was a mayor of chennai so in those kind of places the mayor has political value to it so much so that a senior leader would want to run for mayor okay today in a city like mumbai no senior leader would want to run for mayor because they know the mayor has no powers can i ask you a yeah. stupid governance yeah, question yeah. it's not a stupid question it's a pertinent mumbai ka question i'm asking this on behalf of this whole city why is this metro construction and subway taking so long i wish i could answer that what i would answer is this it's i don't know if you remember what happened last winter in mumbai but the the aqi the air quality index was pathetic it was terrible my daughter is 5 and 1/2 years old all her friends were falling sick in school uh, i think the aqi if i'm not mistaken for 10 consecutive days was higher than delhi in the winter mm. despite crop burning from haryana and punjab which is extremely dangerous um from a health perspective and that's because you had massive construction happening in mumbai plus the cold air coming in so everything basically just fell like a blanket like a fog and you had the construction for the coastal road and the metro and that digging work that construction work and then of course real estate activity which only augments that so to me the real frustration is not so much in why is it taking so much time but why is it being planned in a way where shouldn't it happen it's happening concurrently right now they're both happening at the same time and it's choking mumbai cars and this winter i can assure you you're going to see aqi skyrocket again but that comes down to my earlier point ranveer which is all these questions why is this not happening now who is implementing the coastal road project the bmc who's implementing the metro another agency who is implementing the trans harbor sea link another agency on top of that who is running the railway system in our city the central government mm. who is running the police in our in our city the state government so there are multiple agencies run by multiple governments by the local government bmc by the state government and by the central government who is running the ports in mumbai central government so there's nobody who is coordinating those activities they are all working in silos the mumbai port trust is doing something that suits them but they are not thinking about what might be relevant to the city the city is doing something that suits them but they are not thinking how that affects the airport do you follow and that's not how cities work around the world the way cities so that's why when you go to a, any other city in the world you will find an old port side which doesn't ex- which now the port has moved to another part of the city and that's those docklands are being converted into livable areas into communities uh, just like you see in lower parel where old mill land which were textile mills have now been converted into malls. restaurants malls some residential towers but all this is happening in isolation the state government decided okay we're shutting down the mill lands let's allow commercial buildings which means malls restaurants offices 
and that's are all residential buildings but did you consult the bmc about the road infrastructure mm. did you ensure that while you're increasing the population of people living in that area there are enough hospitals and schools also for them it's that whole when elephants are at war it's the grass that suffers right so in, in so what what this does is that development is preceding infrastructure and that is a classic problem of urban misgovernance in india it's a very 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 serious problem and in my opinion there are many studies which have gone into this but i mean there are varying degrees to it but there's a you can radically improve india's gdp growth if you have the right urban infrastructure in place china one of the reasons china has grown as quickly as it has grown in the last 20 years is because they fixed their urban infrastructure problem in fact they fixed it to such an extent that today they have ghost towns they have cities that nobody lives in so they built excess capacity i'm not saying we should do that but you shouldn't at the at the same time what did we do we didn't build these satellite cities around so when you have more satellite cities you will start to see a change for example your viewers who are in delhi the ncr region is largely delhi noida gurgaon and a little bit of rajasthan so it's got four state governments <laughs> competing for the ncr pie so if i'm a startup and i want to build a building there for my office if up government isn't giving me an incentive in noida i can take that proposal to the haryana government maybe they will in gurgaon if they are not then maybe delhi will there's four states competing mumbai's metropolitan region is only one state but i'm hopeful because this trans harbor sea link and this is a project you know going back to 2002 well before i got into politics i when i was asked in 2004 in my first election that what is one project for mumbai that you think would transform the city i said the trans harbor sea link and i fundamentally believe that when this project is implemented and ready to use and thrown open to the public um it will radically change our life in mumbai i i have to take this conversation to one last political segment sure uh and again it's just a curiosity based question okay uh, this is not coming from the a wrong place uh the one thing i know about media after being a part of it is that it's very easy to create narratives i've had so many narratives created about me which are not true but i've understood the ease with which a narrative can be created which is why i think with podcast you have the opportunity to undo like certain narratives uh i want to know what it was like working in the Man- manmohan singh government and what was he like like we've had lots of people say lots of things about him even on the show but uh you've had like a very long political career and you're young so i i feel you'll be able to say it with a lot more relatability uh the cr- kind of criticism he gets now the way it's, people look back at him everyone respects his role in opening up the indian economy and then suddenly with his pm stint everyone's like no he was too quiet why didn't he speak there's criticism towards sonia gandhi etc what was it like from your eyes you were there yeah so firstly i you know i have had the good fortune of knowing dr manmohan singh um from a very early stage in my life he was a very very close friend of my father's he would come to mumbai till 2003 december four months before he became prime minister he would stay at our place in mumbai and um very very close personal ties a great mentor a great human being a thorough intellectual as an mp my first observation of him as a member of parliament and i i say this you know because i was 27 years old i just got into parliament um parliament there's a premium on age let me put it this mm. way there's there are people are 27 is is very very young uh it's bringing the average age down significantly my first fear was how do i get through to say what i want to say to initiate the debate on right to information to be permitted to speak for 20 minutes to give a speech for 20 minutes to the entire parliament to stalwarts atal bihari vajpayee was a member alk advani was a member dr manmohan singh mrs sonia gandhi manmohan dr manmohan singh was extremely encouraging and my first observation of him as a member of parliament which was very different from knowing him at a personal level before was that he had no insecurity about him he wanted people 
to speak he wanted to consult younger people to seek their opinions when i became a minister and i became a minister for it and uh, telecommunications and it and i do recall at that time his media advisor and we were having a conversation about getting him on social media um once we were having a conversation about the e governance there was a review meeting on the e governance issue he knew his strengths he knew his weaknesses he didn't boast about his he didn't try to sh- hide his weaknesses and show them as strengths he would say very plainly in a meeting this is something i don't understand very well or i'm a little confused about and seek your opinion on it and sometimes even delegate and say if you know it better melin and your ministry secretary knows it better please take a call i trust your instinct on this so then if i look at you know the 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 nuclear deal which was a significant moment in india's history which ended india's civilian nuclear isolation um he led from the front um he when when the when the it, it's 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 little technical but when he started to when india in 2005 during his visit to the white house when george bush was the president that started a series of events where india's nuclear isolation which allowed india to essentially roll out its civilian nuclear capabilities to build nuclear energy by the way in a country like france i think 70% of their energy doesn't come from solar or wind or fossil fuels it comes from nuclear and india was unable to do that and dr manmohan singh ended that isolation and today we are seeing nuclear plants being inaugurated as we speak there's one in gujarat right now um he led that from the front and a lot of us in politics and in the party this was just towards the maybe a year before the elections around the same time as now um and we were concerned we were like why are you why is he pushing this thing through it's controversial at that time mind you even the bjp was opposed to it so he's somebody who i've noticed and i've seen about him in you know unfortunately what happens is politics has become so much about communication so much about media so much about Perceptions. the physical pre- presentation how do you look how do you communicate um how often do you communicate how good is your oratory skills that's the nature of politics and i don't say that that's a bad thing it's a requirement today in politics but when we place a greater premium on issues like that we tend to take away from real substance and real gravitas because there is a a category of politicians in india or around the world for whom polit- communication may be their weak point but having the ability to analyze decipher a problem is something they know well now for example when the lockdowns happened um he predicted for instance what will be the hit on our gdp he says there'll be a 2% loss and sure enough one year later that was the exact figure now that's not that's not an easy thing to to do in a country as vast as ours with so many parameters that go into determining how the economy will look one year from now so that takes gravitas that takes skill you know the reason i want to highlight this whole dr manmohan singh angle is i one of my favorite basketball players is lebron james and one of his favorite quotes is it's uh, about damn time that someone puts respect against my name i do have respect for dr manmohan singh and what he did especially when you talk about the early 90s uh, there's a legacy there's a serious part of the indian legacy that no, belongs to i would say you his. know to be honest uh, not just in the 90s there's no question about it but even in the upa years for instance yeah. lifting 300 million people out of poverty yeah. um uh, for example if today any of us travel on indigo spice jet uh, people who could otherwise never think of flying that's a reform that he initiated during his time in upa yeah. uh if you look at the state of say mumbai airport and what it was prior to its the public private partnership that's a reform that he initiated if you think of uh the telecommunications the power that we have in our pockets uh the advent of 4g that was an initiative during his tenure as prime minister you know the political commentators the input they give is they always praise him and then they say okay the last phase and all those corruption scandals just kind of tarnished the look to be honest with you you know uh, th- these are these are pol- this is politics because if you get into it uh, 2g was a huge 
scandal as per the CAG, but yet the court acquitted all those accused. So who's to what? What does a scandal yeah. mean? Yeah, and and this is and, the truth I figured about talking to the world of politics. Right now, the, if you ask me, I was a telecommunications minister. I've yeah. seen those files, which were in question, which were the controversial files where there was an allegation of corruption. Now there was a choice before the government. Do you want to increase tele density or do you want to make money for the government? I'll give you an example. If you make money from a telecom operator, make a lot of money, take a lot of money from them, great. And you're saying I saved, I gained money for the exchequer. Who's lending those people those money? That money, banks. Mm. If those people can't pay the banks back, the banks collapse. Who's the bank? Who are the shareholders of the bank? In many cases, could be the public, the public of India. Who are depositors of the bank in the bank? The public. So it's like I've t- I've taken money from one pocket, but it's it's like there's a hole. Versus, if you look at a policy where you don't auction spectrum and you say I want tele density to improve because I want that telecom operator to pass that cost advantage to the cu- customer, and that's one of the reasons why we have one of the cheapest tariffs in the world. It's not everywhere in the country that people can enjoy 4G, 5G services at such cheap rates. So, a lot of these things are political. Uh, these have gone through the judiciary. Ultimately, you have to trust the judiciary. The judiciary has opined on them, has passed a verdict on them, has acquitted people who were accused. So, that means that the scam cannot be proved, or someone's not convicted. There was no scam that existed. So, these were things, frankly, Ranveer, where I'm willing to say that in the last three years of UPA, there was a leapfrog in terms of communication technologies, in terms of how politicians communicated. I'm willing to concede that point. That gone were the days where you had to communicate through a newspaper interview, through a television interview. Suddenly you had social media, and that changed things very quickly. And I would agree that we were late as a government to. embracing that technology and that is a reason why certain things were thrown at us and certain things may have stuck at on us mm. but that doesn't take away from the fact that a man like dr manmohan singh had tremendous integrity um tremendous foresight um tremendous courage to see things through to risk political capital to ensure that the nuclear agreement was passed and was somebody who as i said was extremely encouraging uh, was someone who gave people like me a free hand um, and somebody who you know frankly i could we could spend hours debating policies which is not easy to do to debate with an intellectual uh, you know what should our it policy be what should our policy be with internet ott players what should our policy be with apps you know this is what i actually dislike about people on either end of a political spectrum which is that they're not willing to listen to the other side they're not willing to understand that everything is gray and you got to highlight like positives and negatives yeah i think that's that's the nature of how things are stacked up you know people think this leader is good means everything he does is good and he can do no bad or this leader is bad and everything they do is bad and they yeah. can do no good have you had conversations with dr manmohan singh post his tenure about how he looks back at his tenure you know i met him last um a few months ago i can't remember the date i tweeted about it when i met him last and um of course he was physically a little weaker and um there was an image of his recently in parliament as well but he was uh, mentally extremely sharp um he was very very aware of what's happening not just in india economically and politically but extremely articulate about what he sees frankly happening in india's neighborhood we had a pretty long chat about what's happening in south asia uh with our neighbors sri lanka maldives pakistan uh what is happening with china um and um and i think i i, I you know i don't I, i wouldn't ask him about the past because i i know his record and i think that he's he's very comfortable about what he did in the past and he's made that famous statement right history will be kinder when they judge him and i think that he will be seen in a very different light because to be honest you know when he did the economic reforms in 91 for a long time there was a perception 
that he did something terrible to the Indian economy. Really? Of course. I didn't. I didn't. Ninety one was not something which was extremely well received. The opposition at the time, the BJP at the time, were very against economic reform. This is. I've there was never a, heard there was, this. There were famous sayings like you know we want when when we were reforming that we want potato chips not microchips, and there were all those kinds of things. Nobody wanted the economy to open. Um, it it was I think during Vajpayee's era, in two thousand in in ninety nine two thousand, when there was a clear agreement that we have to go into economic reforms and where it transcended parties, but in ninety. One to ninety six, when Narasimha Rao was a prime minister, the opposition at the time, including the BJP, was opposed to it. But today, when we look back, we say, "Thank God we reformed." Best thing that's happened. And generations, people who were born after ninety one, have only seen a reformed India. Um, I'm getting goosebumps as you say that, man. Yeah. Because the older i get and the more i get to learn from people like yourself the more i realize that all this these cameras these mics no i mean you know i'll tell you um you, your generation has never seen you've never had to go to a politician to ask them for a telephone connection <laughs> imagine that was the way things worked at the time i'll tell you in a small way they talk about microphones i was you know i play the guitar and um for me i, I was a I, i am a good guitar player and i was Uh, very very into it when i was young and one of the reasons i gave up playing the guitar was because when i was 13 14 15 when you're just getting into it um to source things that you need for the guitar like a good quality string cables um straps to hold up the guitar uh what they call effects processors pedals you couldn't get those things and um today any music studio any young person in a small town also you see them having access to those technologies having access to those instruments having access so these are all a product and a result of economic reforms yeah breaks my heart a little bit about what he said what dr manmohan singh said um where he hopes that history will be kind of dedicated his whole life you know to our country he's done these incredible things and he's remembered for the last pr campaign that we have gone against Look, I think I personally have extremely high regards for uh, for Dr. Manmohan Singh. I also have, and I think people will settle down and realize in time uh, when things settle. This is this is political dust. It settles, mm. and when it settles, people will realize what were Manmohan Singh's contributions to the country, to the economy. Uh, people will realize, just like I realize, what were Vajpayee Ji's contributions to the economy, what were Vajpayee Ji's contributions to nation building. so every prime minister and i'll tell you even prime ministers who had who were in power for a short while they were prime ministers again well before your time vp singh chandrashekhar um ik gujral many of them in their own small way for a small period of time also had significant contributions of course the nature of the government looked very different it was unstable it didn't last its full term but to think that uh to buy that rhetoric from either side that this one is doing something bad only i think is being very very childish immature immature and the person who buys into those extreme views is unfortunately very uninformed yeah that's what i'd like to conclude the body of this conversation with because we're almost at the end of the conversation we are the conclusive uh part of it i can't thank you enough for speaking for having spoken the way that you did um people from the world of politics are not willing to talk at length and uh with the kind of depth that you just did so trust me you're reaching out to like a whole new audience there's lots of teenage listeners college listeners tuning in who are getting to see you for the first time honestly and uh i'm excited yeah this was so um uh, knowledgeable man like this whole conversation this is all your experience speaking up the way you look at the world of politics so i had a blast honestly thank you thank you no i did too i did too milan deora this was so much fun thank you i really appreciate you uh you've just created a micro fan club of your own with all the people watching this really kind of you and congratulations for all that on all that you're doing really no oh, thank you thank you sir uh very easy talking to you uh and i hope to have you on the show at some point once pleasure again. pleasure thank you. thank you sir thanks again that was the conversation for today 
I'm sure you guys liked it. If you've listened to it till this point, I want feedback from you. I want some kind of coaching from the viewers. What more would you like to see from these political conversations? I'm trying to deep dive. I'm trying to bring you both the right wing and left wing, the pro Modi and anti Modi side of this political debate in India. Uh, I genuinely try not taking any sides. I try bringing you a very centrist perspective. Definitely, it's from what I believe is political perspective in this country. It's based on my own experiences. It's based on my own opinions for sure. But as I've always said. I believe that the right thing to do as a media professional is not to bring your own biases, but to bring your own data points and to bring your own experiences and to bring your own past conversations. Every political conversation informs me much more about the country. And I hope that you're growing along with me. The brutal truth that I've figured, which many people might disagree with, is that there's no one completely good or completely positive political party or political leader for our country. Everyone in this world of politics has taken up this job to help the country, to help the nation move forward. But it's a very complex, very layered world. That's the truth about politics. I'm trying to deep dive, deep dive along with me. Keep supporting us. Tell me who else you'd like to see, especially from the Congress side, from the AAP side. I want to bring all sorts of voices on TRS. Lots of love to you guys. Don't believe what old world media is saying about new world media. That's my final message to you all. New world media is here. New world media is what you are consuming as regular consumers of this podcast. Jai Hind, everything we do is for India and India only. Thank you.